The, the question that this panel is addressing is, uh, is a very big question. Does the practice of quantitative finance need to be changed? We could address that question in many different ways. We could interpret it to be simply asking, given everything that's happened in the world of finance over the past uh, couple of years, do models need to be updated? Uh, we could ask at a somewhat deeper level, uh, does financial engineering create risk or does it help to disperse it uh, efficiently? And perhaps the biggest question of all is how do we distinguish between financial innovation that creates social value from uh, innovations that simply serve to circumvent some, uh, some regulatory or, or legal obstacle? And I think because of those kinds of questions, the bigger questions, quantitative finance has come under a lot of criticism over the past uh, year and a half or so. Uh, some of it perhaps deserved, but some of it perhaps the result of some misunderstanding from the less quantitative uh, side of the world about what exactly takes place in quantitative finance. And I, th I think there are two, two points that stand out in particular in my mind as, uh, as examples of, uh, of real misunderstanding. Uh, one was an article written by Michel Rocard, the former prime minister of France. Uh, he wrote an article in, uh, just about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago in, in the Figaro, uh, in which he referred to quants as committing crimes against humanity. Uh, and, and this from a very respected uh, statesman in France. I mean, he's not a, a fringe character. Actually, it was a little bit worse than what I just said because he was actually accusing the French math professors who train the French quants of committing crimes uh, against humanity by, by distracting the, uh, these uh, innocent students from, from better uh, endeavors. Uh, the other uh, low point for me is the, the famous article that appeared on the cover of Wired magazine by Felix Salmon on the Gaussian copula, the secret formula that destroyed Wall Street and nuked your 401k. I, I think that article sets the record for most number of incorrect statements packed into a title. Uh, again, it's the secret formula. Well, of course, it wasn't a secret formula that destroyed Wall Street and, and nuked your 401k. It's, it's about the, the Gaussian copula, and as a result of that uh, article, uh, poor David Lee, who wrote the original article uh, on, on the Gaussian copula, has gone on to be pilloried, and uh, particularly in the Canadian press, he's been very much blamed as the uh, somehow the, the person who created the whole credit crisis through the creation of this model, which assigns a tremendous amount of importance to the development of a, of a mathematical model. And this is a completely different situation from the one we were in just before the, the crisis. There was a, a report commissioned by Senator Schumer and, uh, and Michael Bloomberg about uh, trying to address threats to New York City's prominence in the financial industry. And the number one conclusion of that report was that the greatest threat to uh, New York's dominance of the, in the world of finance was the, the potential shortage of people quantitatively trained to work in, in the industry. And so they were recommending uh, that the city invest heavily in, in the further development of uh, education and quantitative finance. Uh, National Academy of Sciences and, and, and other uh, eminent organizations had, had adopted quantitative finance as really almost the salvation of quantitative education in, the, in math and physics in the United States with the uh, decreasing role of, uh, of physics in the space program and, and so on. So we've had very short amount of time, a very dramatic shift, I think, in the public perception of quantitative finance. So we have a very distinguished panel here to help us delve into uh, first understanding what, uh, what quantitative finance is and what, uh, what, what its implications are. And, and we have people who bring very different perspectives coming from different aspects of the world of quantitative finance. Uh, at at uh, my far left, uh, Emmanuel Derman. Uh, I think that when students in, uh, in, in Mumbai and Shanghai first learn what a quant is, they, they, they learn it in the context of Emmanuel Derman's name and, and perhaps reading his book. Uh, Emmanuel was for many years uh, head of research at uh, quantitative research at Goldman Sachs and has been at um, uh, teaching in Columbia's engineering school for some years, uh, running the financial engineering program. Uh, next to Emmanuel is uh, Daniel Beunza, 
who's a scholar of management and has uh, studied the sociology of, of Wall Street. He taught here at Columbia Business School for a few years and is now at the London School of Economics. Uh, Kent Daniel, uh, a former, another former academic, uh, taught for many years at uh, the Kellogg School, professor of finance, is uh, currently the uh, director of research at Goldman Sachs Asset Management, where he's also co-chief investment officer. And uh, Adam Parker, chief investment strategist at, and director of quantitative research at Sanford Bernstein and Company, uh, who's uh, got a PhD in statistics and, in fact, I guess several several degrees in, in statistics. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, with Emmanuel. Okay. Can I go over there? Yeah. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. I'm 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 willing to defend David Lee, but I'm not so sure about the French math professors. <laughs> um, but I'm going to say something about that later. Um, so I want to talk about um. Let me just move this thing down. I want to talk a little bit about, there has been a good deal of confusion about in the last couple of years about the role of models in, um, in the financial crisis. And um, I lost my illusions about models a long time ago, um, although I had them at the beginning when I first started working in this area. And I want to talk about a little bit about the difference between models and theories and how models and theories work in different areas. So the big thing I want to distinguish between is between models and theories. And let me start by talking about models. To me, um, most of the models that we use, well, all models, but particularly the models in finance, are really metaphors or analogies, in that they try to compare something you really don't understand very well with, um, with something that you already understand better, maybe through theory or through practice. So for example, if you call a computer an electronic brain, um, that's really a metaphor. A computer isn't an electronic brain, and neither for that matter, although it may have once cast some light on, on thinking about computers that way, and neither is the brain really a computer. That's a model, too. Um, what we do with models in trying, to, um, in trying to tackle all the mysteries of the world, we do our best to explain the things we don't understand in terms of things we already do more or less comprehend. And models take the properties of something you understand that's fairly rich and project them onto something that's strange and that you don't understand. I have an example over here um, in the second bullet point, which I think is a nice financial example of a metaphor and a model um, in a non-quantitative way. It's from Schopenhauer on sleep. And it says, sleep is the interest we have to pay on the capital which is called in a death. And the higher the rate of interest and the more regularly it's paid, the further the date of redemption is postponed. I think it's very beautiful, actually. Um, but what he's doing is by focusing on the periodic nature of sleep, a, period, a periodicity that it shares with coupon payments on a bond, he takes the metaphor of a loan and extends it to life. And then since sleep and coupons are both periodic and coupons are the result of a loan of principle that has to be, that has to be repaid eventually, he depicts life as a loan from a kind of void or darkness that leaves a hole in the darkness that he represents as life and that has to be um, darkened and filled up again. So um, the loan of principle is life and consciousness and death is the final repayment and sleep is a periodic little death every night. Um, Good metaphors in that sense are kind of expansive, I think, and they let you see in the new light both the thing you're trying to explain and the thing you're using to explain it, so they work, they sort of enlighten you upwards and downwards, as that one does. But the model's still a toy. Sleep's more complicated than that, and we're comparing it to something, to finance, which is something we sort of more or less think we understand sometimes, and it does add light. I want to sort of... Um, Oh, I was going to say something about recursion. Um, and that what one's doing over here is trying to take some common property between two different things and extend it. And one does that a lot in mathematics. If you think about analytic continuation, one takes um, the factorial function, which satisfies the recursion relation, n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. And then one takes that property and expands it. That only applies to integers. And one interpolates it as a sort of model into the um, continuum between the integers and out into the complex plane away from the integers and ends up with a gamma function, which one uses a lot in finance and is much richer, but it's also a kind of continuation of a model and extrapolation, which I'm going to come back to in a little while. Um, theories are kind of different in my view. If models are sort of analogies, then, um, then theories make an attempt to be the real thing, not to be an analogy. They don't compare. They try to describe and to actually explain. Um, I'm going to diverge off into physics for a little while, but my favorite um, example in physics is 
1928 Dirac proposed an equation for the theory of the electron that's still correct today, um, almost 100 years later or 75 years later. He was looking for an equation that satisfied, that described an electron and satisfied both quantum mechanics and relativity, which was a very difficult thing to do, and the Schrodinger equation that came before that didn't quite do that for relativity. And he found an equation, unlike the Schrodinger equation, that had four solutions. And two of them had positive energy and described an electron, which, which people already knew had two spin states, spin up and spin down. And so really did describe an electron and its magnetic moment very accurately. But there were two other, there were two other solutions that had incomprehensibly sort of negative, not sort of incomprehensibly negative energy. And nobody could really understand what negative energy made. And people were very uncomfortable because the model worked so well for the electron, but there were these two solutions that didn't seem to bear any relation to reality. And eventually, um, Dirac was, it worked so well for the positive energy, he was, obliged, he was obliged to take it seriously, and over several years came up with this notion of what, what people call the Dirac C, which is that the void that you live in, or the universe, or the vacuum, as physicists call it, isn't really empty at all, um, and is actually filled up to the rim, like a coffee cup, with negative energy states that are all there, and that's the background that you live in. And um, you don't sense it in the same way as um, to be picturesque in the same way as you don't smell air, you only smell the pollutants in the same way you don't um, sense all these negative energy electrons because you live inside them. And then taking this seriously, uh, it sounds funny, but this is true, then taking this seriously, what he, was what he was led to postulate was that if you shoot light into the vacuum with enough energy, you can knock an electron with negative energy out into a positive energy state, like the photoelectric effect, and observe an electron by, by kicking it out of the vacuum, but what's left behind in the, in the vacuum or in the void is a hole in the sea of negative energy electrons. And if you take that seriously, that hole has to behave like an absence of negative energy, just like that Schopenhauer analogy. And, sorry, it has to behave like an absence of negative charge and manifest itself as a positive charge. And in 1932, so he was led to predict the existence of a particle exactly like the electron, but with positive charge. And in 1932, um, Anderson at Caltech discovered the positron, which had exactly those properties, and people were obliged to take this seriously. So Dirac's equation sort of, I don't think it's a metaphor. It starts out as a metaphor with, for the sea. Well, it starts out as an equation. It becomes a metaphor about the sea, but it ends up being absolute reality. And um, the, the, an electron isn't like the Dirac equation. An electron is the Dirac equation. Um, you know, a brain... Um, a brain may be like a computer or an atom may be a little bit like a miniature solar system, but an electron isn't like the Dirac equation. It is the Dirac equation. In the same way electromagnetic waves aren't like Maxwell's equations, they are Maxwell's equations. And I think that's very different from a model. It's an attempt to describe things in its own terms. Um, there's a story of Moses in the burning bush, um, which I have in my third um, bullet point there, where um, God appears to him in the burning bush and he says, who shall I say sent me to go speak to Moses? And God says to him, um, tell him I am what I am. And I think that's sort of what the Dirac equation is doing. It's saying, I'm not like anything. This is the way I am. Um, so models tell you what something is more or less like. Um, theories tell you what something actually is. Um, how long do I still have? Seven minutes? OK. Um, I have an example um, related to derivatives, which is um, which is an example of what I think is a theory, may not be a correct theory, but stands on its own legs. Um, and it's from Spinoza, where he tries to treat emotions the way Euclid treats geometry, by starting out with points and lines. And um, instead, he starts out with them. Um, he tries to apply the same axiomatic method, but he starts out with, he's trying to explain emotions and human behavior. And so his primitives are desire and pleasure and pain instead of points and lines and planes. And um, although he defines them, it's quite clear you wouldn't understand what they were if you hadn't actually been a human being and knew more or less intuitively what desire, pleasure, and pain are. And he adds a couple of other things, which are vacillation and wonder. And then he has a, um, I think this is a theory, a little bit like Freud, he has a bunch of, um, hierarchical definitions in which good is everything that brings pleasure and evil is everything that brings pain. And then love is a derivative. It's pleasure associated with an external object and hate is pain associated with an external object. And then he gets on to convertible bonds, which is envy. It's pain at somebody else's pleasure, so it rests on two underliers, and, um, et cetera. And cruelty is a um, convertible bond with credit risk. Um, uh, cruelty is the desire to inflict pain on, on someone that's loved. Um, <laughs> I think it's fairly accurate, actually. It looks, it, um, well, 
he, he goes, actually, I'm, I'm not going to take a lot of time, but here's a diagram I made of all of the emotions that I was able to track out of there, and you can see how they relate to the red, the blue, and the purple, which are pain, pleasure, and desire. And he really builds up a hierarchy of emotions that some of which don't even have names for him, like schadenfreude, which is pleasure at somebody else's pain, but isn't actually in there. Um, so I think this is a good example of a theory, um, as opposed to a model, in that it doesn't make any analogies to anything other than using Euclid's method. I want to finish up by talking in that light about models in finance. So um, the point of models, I think, people usually think the point of models is divination, but I think there's actually a not missing in that top bullet point. I think the point in finance is really usually not divination, which really works. Forecasting the future doesn't work in, in financial models. And I think what most models do, somebody referred in the audience earlier in um, the previous talk to going from illiquid, from liquid to illiquid securities. And I have this example, which I think is a perfectly typical financial model, is supposing you know the price of apartments in Battery Park City downtown, and they're all two, they're all two room apartments, and you'd like to estimate the price or the value of an of a eight room Park Avenue co-op. How would you go about doing it? And sort of first order, if, if there wasn't a liquid market in eight room co-ops. And what you do is take the square footage of the Battery Park City apartment, and then calculate the price per square foot, and then extend it to the square footage of the, of the bigger Park Avenue apartment, and then say, OK, well, that gives me a first order estimate. And then you make corrections for location, views, doormen, schools, Central Park, et cetera. And if you think about it, the price per square foot isn't really the real price per square foot. It's the implied price per square foot, just like volatility when you take an option price is the implied volatility backed out of the model. In this case, the model is um, not volatility is constant, but price per square foot is the same across apartments. So of course, it's not true, but as a first guess, it's not bad. Um, and I think that's what one does in most of these models, um, in financial models. So I think models do two things. First of all, they transform intuitive linear quantities you can think about into nonlinear dollar values. So it's easier to think about price per square foot or implied volatility or default rate or um, or future short-term rates than to think about dollar prices or apartment prices. So they convert price per square foot to apartment price or volatility to option price. The second thing is, um, well, let me, let me drop down to the second last, second last uh, um, bullet point. Um, what models are useful for is ranking securities by value on a one-dimensional scale. Clearly, securities are really pretty complicated. Um, if you look at bonds, they have different expirations, different um, maturities, and different coupons, and different issues. But if you rank them all on a one-dimensional um, yield to maturity scale or options on an implied volatility scale, it gives you some sense of where value lies, even though it's an approximation. Same as ranking apartments by price per square foot. And I think that's how people in markets use models. And finally, as somebody in the audience asked, I think what all of these models do is really, in finance, more than predict, is interpolate from liquid prices to illiquid prices. So Black Shoals takes you from liquid, liquid short-term bonds and um, stocks to illiquid, or what used to be illiquid options. More sophisticated models take you from illiquid options, from liquid vanilla options to illiquid exotic options, and they're always used to interpolate or extrapolate. Um, given all of that, um, I want to wrap up by trying to say in two minutes what I think is the right way to use valuation models. And first of all, one has to just acknowledge that in finance, models aren't theories. Um, they're all pictures. Black Scholes makes a lot of invalid, um, I'm going to say something, but a lot of invalid assumptions about the world. Um, it's making an analogy to Brownian motion, which really isn't accurate. Um, stocks are not, are not smoke particles diffusing. There is really no right model. Um, just like there's no right model airplane, the model depends on the purpose. There isn't a right toy version of an airplane. And so when you use models, I think you have to make the minimum assumptions you can. So in the options world, you start with static replication, which makes no assumptions about um, dynamic trading. If you can't do that, you do the great Black Scholes Merton discovery of dynamic replication. If you can't do that, you do cruder and cruder things until finally you just decide on your utility in taking risk. Um, I think you should avoid what the French, uh, French math professors do, which is axiomatize, um, axiomatize um, options theory. Uh, I've interviewed a lot of people in my time at Goldman Sachs who, when you ask them why you can price options, they tell you because of Gersanov's theorem, which I think is a really bad answer. Um, and I think they get that out of learning options too much as a theory rather than as a, excuse me, as a mathematical exercise rather than as a practice. 
um, for some reason in physics, it really does pay to axiomatize things and drop down deep and formulate a principle like the principle of least action. But in finance, with models, I think shallow is kind of better, and you're better off going from what you can easily observe in the liquid market to estimating liquid prices. Um, I think Black-Scholes is a great model from that point of view in that um, since you're making all these assumptions with models, you always have to sweep dirt under the rug, and the honest thing to do is to make the dirt visible, even though you're avoiding it. And I think Black-Scholes is great from that point of view because it tells you exactly what you're assuming and, and um, lets you estimate how to, um, how to take account of the things you're not assuming. I think Gaussian copula is worse from that point of view because it's not really a dynamic replication model, and there's much more hidden under the rug there. There's no dynamics specified in the evolution of the bond prices. There's no market in, in, in there's no observed default correlation between um, corporations, and there's not much of a market in implied default. Um, so I think when you use models, you have to look over your shoulder all the time and um, take them seriously and push them as far as you can, which is what I think people have done with option pricing. But then you have to look over your shoulder and um, make, make sure that um, understand that there isn't a theory of everything and you can't write down a one-line equation like Newton's law that's going to explain the whole um, financial universe and um, something's going to go wrong. Thanks. I think I'm going to stop there. Okay, um, so um, my name is Daniel Beunza, and I'd like to start by um, thanking Bruce um, for inviting me here. Um, this audience of uh, financial economists and um, financial engineers is a, is a privileged audience for a sociologist of finance uh, like myself. Um, and and it's, I'm particularly happy to be here um, because um, for the past three years, uh, before I moved uh, to the London School of Economics, I had the, uh, the joy and the privilege uh, to be on the faculty uh, at Columbia Business School. And, um, and so um, I spent three years um, uh, telling people, uh, evangelizing, in effect proselytizing about the, um, about the uh, sociology of finance. I found myself um, tweeting for coffee and taking out for lunch uh, my financial economist uh, colleagues uh, one by one. Um, so um, now you know, there's a lot, a lot of you here, so this is a lot more, a lot more effective. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, my presentation is going to be um, a brief comment on, on Donald's uh, presentation, um, and I'm, on to, I'm going to offer another way uh, to think about um, the um, advantages and the disadvantages in financial models. So um, if I have to uh, give uh, my own reading of uh, Donald's analysis of um, the, um, uh, the, the credit crisis, is that uh, the credit crisis as a case of counterperformativity is really a story of, of a marriage uh, gone astray. Now, this marriage is, is the story of a marriage between um, the um, mortgages uh, bankers, um, the people behind the, um, the um, uh, ABS, uh, the asset back uh, securities, and the uh, derivatives uh, bankers, uh, those behind the uh, CDOs. Um, so the outcome of this, uh, of this marriage, the ABS CDO, uh, could have turned out to be uh, terrific, but instead uh, was uh, turned out to be disastrous. Um, and um, now Donald didn't have time to go into detail in his presentation, um, but um, he does have a, a paper which I believe is available uh, on the website of the uh, Bernstein Center in which he explains in detail um, the mechanisms whereby the availability of um, the ABS uh, securities changed uh, the mortgages market and the way in which uh, the CDOs the ABS CDOs changed the uh, asset-backed securities. Um, and the key element that I take from, from his account, which unfortunately we didn't hear this morning, is the removal of a key actor, uh, which was the mezzanine investors, who were the really savvy uh, investors who would have been the watchdog that prevented the uh, mortgages and the ABS uh, markets from changing and from, it would have prevented the gaming from taking place. Um, so in a way, uh, the absence of these actors who introduced friction and dissonance into the picture was what led 
uh, to the changes in the gaming that then uh, you know, evolve into the crisis. Um, what I'm going to present uh, briefly today is uh, the ways in which um, a similar mechanism uh, of uh, suppression of lack of friction um, can lead uh, to disasters in the context of financial modeling. Um, so the setting is um, a research project that I have undertaken uh, with my colleague David Stark at the uh, sociology uh, department. Um, I'm going to, uh, so this is really uh, we, uh, but I'm going to uh, talk about uh, my findings uh, by using the first person just because it's easier for me. Um, so what I, so what we uh, and, and, and I uh, did is we spent uh, three years doing an ethnographic uh, research study of how derivatives are used in an equity derivatives trading room on Wall Street. And so uh, several publications uh, have come out of that study, and we studied uh, how arbitrage was organized. Uh, we studied uh, several issues around uh, the life of these traders. Um, but uh, the study that I want to bring today uh, to the table is uh, our study of the way in which merger arbitrageurs use financial models. Uh, so what we report on is a continuous uh, morning of trading that we observed uh, after three years and 65 visits to the trading room in which we uh, understood what it, what it was that they were doing. So on May 27th of 2003, the date of the morning of observation, uh, I showed up at the merger arbitrage desk at 9 a.m. Uh, to find out that there was a new merger had been announced between two for-profit education companies. Um, and the arbitrageurs were typing data into their computers. Um, and um, and what, what, what they were really doing is they were setting up an arbitrage trade so how do merger arbitrageurs uh, profit from merger announcements? When, announcement, when an announcement comes up, um, it's a little bit like when two Hollywood celebrities um, announce a wedding. Um, they, they, they unleash a whole set of uh, questions and, and writings and analysis as to whether that wedding, in effect, is going to take place. Uh, so in the same way, when uh, Whitman Education and Career Education announce their merger, at 5.58 p.m. Uh, on uh, May 26th, uh, on May 27th, arbitrageurs started to uh, debate whether that announced merger was in, in effect going to happen or not. So what the arbitrageurs do is they estimate the probability that um, the merger uh, will effectively take place uh, six or three months after the announcement, and they use that as a way to value uh, the, uh, the merger target, the acquisition target. And so they have the uh, value that comes out from the merger, if, if, if the, the, the value implicit in the merger and the price of the stock, and they exploit the differences between the two. So what did I see as I arrived uh, to the desk? What I saw them is uh, typing up data on their models and using a database uh, that they had developed over the years in which they uh, put in the uh, factors and the different variables that draw merger success for all the arbitrage trades that they had developed. Um, and so as I sat in the middle of those traders and observed what they were doing, I heard them um, using their judgment uh, to come up with ways to think about this merger. So they were, for example, debating whether, uh, what, what was the industry category that these, the combined entity would belong to? Um, they were debating uh, what were the right analogies to think about this merger? What was the right analogy a scandalous uh, 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 operation that had taken place in um, for profit education, but on a different level of primary education in the past, or was that not the right analogy? And by doing that, they came to uh, how to think about their probability of merger success. So at some point in the morning, as um, the um, stock in the target opened up a little bit late, um, they calculated the spread implicit in that price, and they decided to uh, take a position. Then other things happened uh, because the merger was active in uh, 30 deals at the same time during the morning. But the key breakdown, the key point uh, in this morning of observation came two hours later when they checked again the spread and then they got worried. So let me recap. Uh, there was the spread uh, of the merger that they observed at 10 a.m. 
and then the same number at 12 a.m. At 10 a.m., it was a positive sign, and they uh, took a position uh, betting that the merger would take place. But at 12 p.m., they decided that this was a cause for concern. Same number, different uh, interpretation. What was going on? And what is the use of number of models involved in this operation? So what my co-author and I uh, realized was that the arbitrageurs were in effect um, taking the spread, which is the difference in the price between the target and the acquirer, uh, adjusted by the terms of the merger, uh, they were taking that price as a, as, a, as a sign of the confidence that the rest of the market has um, in the merger. And, and it's in, intuitively it's easy to see why they would do that. So if the merger in effect takes place, the two companies become the same one, and the differences in the prices will become zero. If the two companies don't merge, then these will be two different entities and their prices will differ. But uh, the arbitrageurs were able to go beyond that, and by using, mo uh, uh, by using a modeling technique, they were able to uh, get at the implied probability uh, that the uh, spread was conveying to them. And so this is the same technique known as backing out uh, that Donald uh, explained in the case of uh, Black Scholes. So in the same way that one can use Black Scholes to find out the implied volatility and then make bets uh, based on that, our arbitrageurs were using uh, the spread um, to find out the implied uh, merger probability. Um, and, and why that is interesting is uh, the use of the um, spread uh, led them to question whether they were doing the right thing or not. Um, and so uh, after this point in time at 12, they went back to the databases, they searched for news uh, that would cast doubt on the merger, and having found no negative news, they increased their exposure. So what my co-author got from this is that uh, this is a really interesting use of models. Uh, the, the model allows you to translate the prices uh, that are readily available out there in the market into how the market is thinking about the deal. So think about the magic. Um, you don't need to talk to anybody. You don't need to know anybody else in the market. All you, all you have to do is you have the right model, you have the prices, and you can see how the rest of the market is thinking. So we call this a reflexive modeling, and, um, and, and, and we concluded that this was a very useful way of using financial models. It allowed them to see opportunities that others, that others didn't see, and it allowed them to uh, uh, attain greater returns. However, um, our continued exploration of the, um, of the merger arbitrage desk uh, led us to see that just as the use of, this use of mergers for reflexive, sorry, of models for reflexive purposes has advantages, it also has disadvantages. And in particular, what we found is that one can trace the effect of models uh, in uh, the existence of uh, a concept uh, coined in financial economics known as arbitrage disasters. So arbitrage disasters is an expression developed by Mika Officer uh, from USC uh, to denote uh, those, um, those, those uh, merger arbitrage trades that generate um, implied collective losses on the arbitrage community of more than half a billion. And so uh, what we found is that um, these arbitrasters are fueled by the use of uh, reflexive modeling, by the use of models in order, to, by the use of models to be reflexive about one's own estimates of the future. Specifically, uh, what we observed is uh, that in the case of uh, G. Honeywell, um, the use of, of um, the use of a reflexive modeling uh, led the arbitrageurs. Uh, to increase their exposures um, above and beyond what they would otherwise have uh, attained um, and then experience even bigger losses as the merger uh, was canceled. So I'll explain a little bit more. Uh, what happened in the uh, G. Honeywell uh, merger? This happened in 2003. And the story of the, of the merger is one in which um, everybody expected the merger to succeed. Um, but in the last minute, the um, competition commissioner in the European Commission, uh, Mario Monti, uh, decided to rule against the merger. Uh, the merger uh, led to uh, collective implied losses of 
billion uh, on the arbitrage community, and our specific traders lost uh, six million, uh, so our relatively modest loss. But the, the total loss is, is sizable. Um, so one can see this merger uh, trade uh, as, an, as an instance of, uh, of just a simple, uh, something that reasonable people would expect, and the unreasonable happened, so reasonable people experienced losses. But uh, what we found is that um, as the merge, as the arbitrageurs were um, doing, in, engaging this trade, uh, they were using the spread as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way to see whether they were in line with the rest of the market or not. And the rest of the market was just as mistaken as they were. And on seeing that they seem to be correct on the right track, they increased their exposure, um, and then uh, they ended up experiencing even bigger losses. So I see that uh, I, need to, uh, I need to stop now. But uh, what I take out of this uh, instance is that the use of models uh, uh, is a, is a two-edged uh, sword. It can lead to uh, better opportunities for reflexiveness, but it can also lead collectively uh, the traders astray. Um, and I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's a really interesting topic. I love Donald's talk. It was uh, fascinating and really insightful, and it's a pleasure to be here. So what I thought I'd talk about is um, a couple different things. First off, how do we think about models kind of along the lines of, uh, of what, uh, I guess, the topic of the, the conference. And uh, I want to emphasize especially the importance of empirical validation of models. And I'd like to talk a little bit too about, you know, to what extent did over-reliance on these models uh, really come about because of the complexity of the models, because of the fact that quantitative models were being used. So um, in terms of, you know, how do we think about models and how do we think about this theory? One of the things that I guess I find a little disturbing about this is the idea that um, the world existed, people were trading securities, and all of a sudden, we came up with models, and that changed the world. And I guess I would have the view that instead, people were always using models to price security. Anytime you buy or sell something, you better have an idea of what that thing is worth. And the way people are going to do this is through a model. Now, what is a model? I actually like the manual's definition a lot. Basically, it's a metaphor. Most of the things that we go out and buy and sell are far too complex that we can just understand them in a very simple way. So what we do is we form some construct in our mind, which is a lot simpler, but what there, where there are a lot, of the analog, a lot of analogies with the thing you're trying to, to value. Now, there are good models and there are bad models, okay? Um, and certainly in most decisions that individuals make, I think, they probably tend to use models that aren't too good. Um, one of the books that I read over the last uh, six months that I found really insightful is a book by Akerlof and Schiller. Some of you have probably seen it's called Animal Spirits. And there's a lot of discussion in there. You might remember Bob Schiller. He's the guy who wrote um, back, in fact, I know it was released in March 2000, and it was called Irrational Exuberance. And he talked about the tech bubble. And in fact, shortly after, I think that book was actually released at the peak of the NASDAQ. So following the release of that book, the NASDAQ fell dramatically. And then more recently, a couple of years ago, he released another book on the real estate bubble. Um, and subsequent to the release of that book, of course, real estate prices tanked. So in fact, if you think about motives for regulation, we should be prohibiting Bob Schiller from writing any more books. Uh, the, in this book by Akerlof and Schiller, what they do is they talk about uh, some behavioral ideas behind what might possibly be causing the various bubbles, the various financial panics that we've seen through history. And I guess I would characterize what they're saying is people are using really bad models. So for example, in one of the chapters, they're talking about the recent real estate bubble. And one of the things that they discuss is some of the stories that you see appearing in the popular press. And all of these stories are things like, you know, person X bought a house in um, Florida and the prices went up 50%. And person Y bought a house somewhere else and prices went up. So there's not a real detailed examination of the empirical evidence, it's a lot of stories. But that, that forms a type of model. If you think about it going back to certainly the, uh, 
the tech bubble, there were a lot of stories around about how this was a new world, things were different now, and all of these firms were going to make a lot of money, competition wasn't going to drive down their profits, okay, basically the returns to capital were going to be huge. So these were two models, but I would argue they were very flawed models. Why were they so flawed? Well, first off, there wasn't a lot of very deep thought that went into them, and also they weren't empirically tested. You know, do uh, do real estate prices ever go down? Well, according to these stories, the answer was no. But certainly, if you look over a very long time period, yes, you do see real estate, lots of real estate bubbles through history, and prices falling dramatically following these real estate bubbles. And similarly, around lots of technological innovation, you see a rapid rise in stock prices and a subsequent decline. Uh, Warren Buffett actually has one really interesting piece from the late 90s on this. Um, the Okay, so what has, has finance done that's good? You know, we've talked a lot about how finance theories have maybe caused some damage. Well, I think one of the key things that finance has really pushed forward is the idea that we should throw data at all of these models that we come up with, and we should empirically examine them, and we should take every piece of data we have got and throw it at these models and see if they work, okay? And I think, you know, talking about you introduce a model that makes things, um, uh, that can somehow make things worse, well, remember, every model is replacing another model to, to the extent that model does a better job describing the world than the model that's already in place. For example, story-motivated models, other more casual models, that model's gonna, gonna make money for the people who are using it. And certainly over the last 20 years on Wall Street, quantitative finance has come to, occupy a very prominent position. There was, you know, essentially nobody 30 years ago doing quantitative finance. How come? Well, because these models came in and basically there was a lot of inefficiency in the market and I would argue that inefficiency came about precisely because people were using casual models as opposed to more sophisticated models that had been empirically validated, okay? Now, um, you know, one of the, um, oh, and by the way, these quantitative models, you know, the, uh, uh, I liked what Paul said a minute ago that, you know, the demand for quant now is really, really growing and it's growing in lots of different areas. Probably some of you have read the book Moneyball, um, you know, which details how much quant practices have made a difference in even baseball, in even how you figure out which baseball players you're going to hire. How come? Well, again, because previous, prior to the advent of these, uh, these more quantitative models, people were using very casual, very uh, kind of off the cuff models which relied on rules of thumb that had never been empirically validated. So it's, you know, it's empirical validation. It's really building something that you can test that's important, okay? Uh, another area where obviously quantitative techniques are incredibly important is in, um, uh, air, in aircraft safety. And you know, if you think about it, why, are, why is air travel so safe now? And the answer is because people basically build effectively models of how pilots should behave, of how aircraft systems should be designed. And then now we've got wonderful data because we've got, you know, uh, quite a few years where we've kept incredibly detailed data on what can go wrong. And by apply applying quantitative techniques, we have managed to make air travel incredibly safe. Okay. All right. Uh, let me jump back to finance. Um, one of the people that Donald mentioned in his talk is Blair Hull. And I know when I used to teach options back at, actually when I was at the University of Chicago, uh, one of the books that I used to assign my students was a book by a guy named Jack Schwager uh, that was called The New Market Wizards. And it's a wonderful book. And in there, in one of the chapters, he had interviews with um, a set of traders, one of whom was Blair Hall, who had participated in options market and basically done quantitative techniques. And the uh, chapter with Blair Hall was particularly interesting because he was somebody who started out, he basically learned the black shells formula and went to Chicago and started trading options. And the, um, the, the book kind of traces the evolution of his thinking. And he said, you know, basically I learned black shells, I went to the option pits, I tried it and I made a lot of money, okay? And I think what I remember being particularly struck by was he was saying it was so amazing because you could use Black Shoals in the first part of this, this experience, when the option pits had first opened in, I think, 73, and you could make money. It was amazing, okay? Now, what he, of course, 
what's striking about this is he knew the Black-Scholes model was completely wrong. He knew normality was a bad assumption. But nonetheless, by plugging in you know, some really bad estimate of volatility, probably historical volatility, into this model, you could make money. Now, of course, what he says is very quickly, if you tried to make money using Black-Scholes, you were going to lose a lot of money. And the reason is because the market became more sophisticated. They quickly realized that this model that was a lot better than what people were using previously, Black-Scholes, had to be replaced with something more sophisticated, where you realized that things were not normal, that there was a possibility of fat tails, and so on. Okay? But I think you know, the, the market innovated, and people became more sophisticated about trying to understand the, the way that markets really worked, and understand whether these underlying assumptions like normality were really correct. Um, and so I guess, you know, one of the things that I would say, you know, did, did the market really rely on normality in setting prices? You know, my sense is that by 87, that wasn't really true. You know, certainly if you look prior to the crash of 87, it's true that the option smile had been relatively flat, but prior to that crash, the tail probabilities came up quite a bit. There's actually a wonderful paper by Eduardo Schwartz and another co-author that demonstrates this. Um, now, the other thing I wanted to talk about for a second, um, how much time do I have, Paul? Another five minutes. Another five minutes, okay, perfect. Um, my sense is um, that the financial crisis was really not caused by the presence of these sophisticated models, but I would argue almost by not enough good quantitative finance. So specifically, if you look at what really happened um, to estimates of risk from about 2002 through the beginning of 2007, various estimates of risk fell really, really dramatically. If you look at the VIX, the VIX fell from levels above 40% to down, if you look in January 2007, the VIX got down below 10%. Okay, the long-term volatility of the market is on the order of 20%. Okay, so very, very low. Uh, the ABX contract, which basically looks at mortgage, uh, mortgage risk, mortgage-backed security risk, that fell by 60 to 75%. Uh, measures of the risk in corporate debt, like CDX spreads, fell 60 or 70%. Okay, so there were all of these measures of risk, and they kept coming lower and lower and lower. Okay, and now, part of this was driven by this perception in the broader economy that risk had disappeared. Not disappeared, but it had moved to a much, much lower level. So, for example, a lot of you might remember that in 2004, Bernanke made his great moderation speech. Okay? And what this resulted in was this period where um, volatility in the market became much, much lower, probably because people at some level believed that volatility was going to be lower. So in that sense, it was kind of almost, it appears to have been a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Lots of money flowed in as a result of this lower volatility that perhaps resulted in lower volatility. And by the way, I'm really speculating here, right? But it certainly has the feel that that's what was happening. Um, you know, I heard the comment at one point in uh, early 07 that volatility was really low, and somebody commented that this was like, a, holding a ball underwater. Somehow the market forces were keeping volatility very, very low. Okay? Now, this led to a lot of risk taking by various people in the sense that people were now willing to take bigger positions. Why were they willing to take these bigger positions? Because risk was so low. Now, I guess what I would ask here is what really went wrong? Was this really the result of all of the sophisticated models that were being used on Wall Street that caused these estimates of risk to be so low? I don't think so. I think it was kind of the underlying parameter that went into a lot of the models, but it was more like people hadn't thought about, well, is there a good chance that risk is going to pop up again? And I think there wasn't a sufficient appreciation of that. Rather, it was that people were maybe spending a little bit, we're looking at too short a history, okay? And we're also, um, uh, maybe had adopted too quickly this new paradigm that risk had disappeared, okay? All right, so why don't I stop there? Um, you know, in terms of the conclusion, I guess I'd say, again, the, the best way to think about models and the effect of models, I think there is something to, the, to this idea that, um, you know, when people adopt a new model, maybe the good parts of the new model as well as the bad parts of the new model obviously do cause prices to change. But 
the, the thing I question is how quickly these models are going to evolve. To the extent there's a bad part of the model, something like IE, a constant volatility assumption in Black-Scholes, my sense is the market participants actually pick this up moderately quickly. Um, certainly in terms of, uh, let me address one, one more thing really quickly. In terms of CDO pricing, to what extent did prices reflect the you know, the assumptions underlying the Gaussian copula model. There's actually a paper by uh, three guys at HBS, at Harvard Business School, uh, J uh, Koval, Jurek, and Malloy, that looks at this and they show that in fact prices are not consistent with the Gaussian copula model. Uh, there's a new paper by, in fact, uh, uh, one guy here, Pierre Colin Dufresne, and another guy, Bob Goldstein, and they show that in fact the market was incorporating into that various, you know, jump processes, things like this. So these, these sorts of ideas were incorporated into the prices of CDOs, although you could argue certainly that the magnitudes that they were expecting in terms of the jump in real estate prices was obviously not in the prices of these securities. Okay, thanks. Hi, um, I'm Adam Parker. Uh, the question, uh, I guess, we were posed with was, does the practice of quantitative finance need to be changed? And the, the speakers so far have talked about sleep, death, love, hate, pain, passion, marriage, acting, Hollywood, celebrity, weddings, baseball, and safe airplanes. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering why anyone would want that to change. <laughs> it sounds good to me. Um, all right, I'm going to take a pretty uh, different tack to this. Um, I talk to uh, institutional investors, uh, fundamental bottom-up stock pickers, and folks who build quant models focused on uh, equity, uh, equities only. And I'm going to try to talk a little bit about um, what the point is of these quantitative researchers and modelers on the, equity, on the equity side, on the buy side, and maybe some of the criticisms they get, some of the things that maybe we try to help them with or we're trying to work on to, to get better with. I think one of the things that uh, quantitative uh, researchers do in equities is they try to help generate buy ideas, right? They try to help the fundamental portfolio managers fish from an advantage C. And, um, you know, and that, that can be held to some criticism, right? Because they're just generating ideas and, and who knows, uh, it assumes, like, like other people said, that, that history will be exactly the same as, as the future. One of the things that we try to do and believe in is that you have to combine uh, the, this quant framework with fundamental uh, bottom-up work. And so I, I work at Sanford Bernstein, and, and the parent company is a company called Alliance Bernstein, which is a fairly large asset manager around uh, $500 billion uh, under management. We were able to get access to uh, the buy sides uh, uh, fundamental recommendations. And like most buy sides, they have uh, their analysts have one, two, three, four, five recommendations, th these buy side analysts, for whether or not they like stocks. And so what we did was we took about 11 years of data from the buy side, and then we said, okay, when the fundamental bottom-up stock pickers like it, an idea and the quantitative signals agree, what is the subsequent performance? And in fact, it's quite strong. On the other hand, when we got a hold of those uh, buy sides uh, picks uh, and, and quant signals disagreed, like momentum or valuation or capital use or others, the subsequent performance was mute to weak. So we're, I think one thing you know, we would certainly recommend is not using the quant framework in isolation, but actually using it uh, as a way to uh, then do bottom-up work, using it in conjunction, not separate from uh, fundamentals. Uh, a second thing that quantitative people do on, on uh, quantitative research do in the equity side is, is they do attribution of portfolios. They, you know, I, I think it's pretty well trodden over in academic research that uh, I think, or just anecdotally, maybe, and I'm wrong, <laughs> that uh, people spend more time thinking about their buy decisions than their sell decisions. Um, and so I think in practice, there's some things you can do there. One of the things that we proved in, in, in our alpha model, we forecast equity returns as part of what we do, and we actually, in the stocks that our model likes, when there's lots of factors contributing to that uh, positive performance, uh, so-called low concentration, that means uh, that the performance is even better. When on, on the flip side, if our alpha model doesn't like a stock, uh, it's even worse if there's only one reason. So oftentimes people are just thinking the stock went down a lot and I'll finally sell it. Uh, and, and so the sell signal, uh, it, it, the sell decision is less developed. So one of the things I think you know, quants can do to try to protect themselves is to think more about the sell, sell signals more actively. One of the things we do is we build a model to assign a probability a stock's going to be bad in the next uh, a few months, uh, trying to capture uh, the, the fact that returns don't have a normal distribution but actually have fatter tails by using this 
logistic regression framework and assigning this probability. We provide to investors these high probability ideas. So there's lots of things people are working on to try to find uh, a better way to get at the sell ideas given that just fundamental uh, PMs, uh, portfolio managers often spend less time thinking about uh, sell decisions than buy decisions. Third thing I think is, I, I, I don't know if it's a mistake, but I certainly hear a lot that people treat quant models like a black box. They just say, uh, the, mo the, the model's telling me to do this, or I'd like to turn the model on or off. And I think most quantitative uh, people would say, I'd like a systematic way to figure that out, not just the fundamental PM who doesn't know anything about quant deciding to turn my, my, my model off. So uh, one of the things that we work on and try to help people with think about is, is a decomposition. It's kind of taking this thing that looks like a black box and, um, and, and, and breaking it down. And so we uh, try to talk a lot to, to people about something we would call a snapshot, right? You can type a ticker in uh, Intel um, you can look at all of the factors that historically uh, contributed to subsequent stock performance, whether they're positively or negatively contributing today, and sort of decompose this this black box and try to, you know, then then enable the decision maker to say, okay, does this make any sense is it at all, or you know, uh, break down the black box for people. For it's not it's not just hey, you, you quant guys are doing something, and I don't I don't get it. I think another sort of thing that that quantitative people do on the equity side kind of taking it a little further, is to think more about portfolio construction. So in practice, I think an important function is to go beyond buy and sell ideas and attribution and decomposition, but to think about construction. And, and you know, obviously Bernstein and a number of other uh, firms out there obviously, you know, have alpha models and risk models and, and optimizers um, and, and try to take into account things like turnover and transaction costs to try to help um, managers make better risk-adjusted decisions. You know, we, we do this quant conference at, at Bernstein every year, um, and in 2008, there were 400 attendees, and we had a, um, an interactive uh, device in the audience, and 20% of the respondents said they did not know what a risk model was. Um, so that seems like uh, there have been jokes since that by many that obviously the, the real number was more like 100, but I, I think the, uh, the truth is that uh, taking it beyond just the, the equity alpha framework, but actually thinking about uh, the, the, the the practical implications of what you're doing in quant, uh, in quant uh, is, is not something that every quant on the buy side is actually charged with, actually. So I think um, taking it to the portfolio construction level is important. Now, what are some of the weaknesses or criticisms we hear uh, often and try to help uh, quants defend the, themselves with? Well, uh, one was, um, you know, you guys, everyone's doing the same thing. So that's, that's, that's why this is happening. Everyone's doing the same thing. So one of the things we did is we um, got access to 30 uh, buy-side firms' uh, alpha models. And what we discovered is kind of interesting, that e even if uh, two models could have the exact same factors in them, in other words, classic valuation, capital use, growth, whatever the, the metrics were in, in, their, in their alpha model, and one, one of those could be a top quintile performing model, and one could be a bottom performing model, all predicated on uh, construction decisions that they made. Not, not, you could use to have the same factors, but have different performance. And so one of the things we try to focus people on are, are some of the decisions they make, you know, whether it's um, the, the, the sample period they use, I think is, a, is an easy one to talk about. Um, if you're, it's self-indicting, but if you're, you know, kind of a twisted person like me, you know which factors worked in every year for the last 40 years. So if I build a model where the construction period is 1982 to 97, well, I know that's a unique period where valuation metrics work great, and then my subsequent model will be valuation biased, and in the future, in 2010, if that's what works, then I'm great, right? So the, something as simple as the sample period you use can, can certainly uh, impact your, your performance uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, obviously, how you uh, compute the parameter estimates, if you do a pooled regression or a bunch of uh, cross-sectional uh, uh, estimation, or if you standardize the variables, et cetera. There's all these construction uh, techniques can actually mean more. And so you try to think about how you can be different um, in, in some of those techniques. And I think it was just kind of interesting to get, uh, I guess, the trust of 30 of our clients to give us their, their models. Um, and so we could kind of compare. Um, so I think it's not just that your people are using the same factors. It's actually important that you use different uh, construction techniques. And the things that we're trying to think about to, to um, 
uh, be different. And one thing we, we do is we, in our alpha models is we try to condition by style. I think a lot of times quants sort of think, you know, I don't really care. I want to pick good stocks and, and short bad ones. But it is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy that, um, uh, you know, value managers own stocks uh, that, that, are, that are cheaper than the, the benchmark. And, of course, the consultants make, make them do that so that they're not creeping and that uh, people who are giving them their money um, are getting the hedge that they want. And so... Um, I, I think conditioning by style or, or thinking about how to uh, build different models for different types of stocks can be important and useful, and I don't think that's ubiquitously done on, on the buy side. Um, you know, one way we get at that actually in stocks outside the U.S. is we have something called the growth value continuum, which is e each night we assign a percentage of growth and value to each name and then use those percentages. So it's, it's a way of trying to, you know, react uh, to one of the things that quants talk a lot about uh, to us, which is regime shifting or sort of factor timing, uh, you know, kind of ways to try to get at the recent information and, and use it. I think the truth is, just one last thought, you know, somebody asked me a year ago, um, we, most alpha models that we've seen, equity models, forecast 12-month returns. And so somebody asked me, why do you forecast 12-month return, and, I, and the, originally I, I thought, well, that's a, that's a really great question. I think in this case the person asked it by accident, uh, but, um, but it's a great question uh, because I don't know if it's, um, you know, everyone gets paid once a year or it's the convention or, you know, uh, the, the same reason there's 24 hours in a day and if we started over there'd be 10 or something, I don't know. So what we do and a lot of what the buy side does is we do our best to solve this problem of 12 month return when that's not what, what we're probably best at. In fact, we're probably best at 4.2 month return or something else. And so one of the things that we're working on, which I, I think is interesting, novel, using the word novel would be grandiose, uh, is just actually for e each night for, for each uh, stock, uh, forecasting different alpha horizons. So one month horizon and maybe three or six and 12 and 36, et cetera, and looking at differences and dislocations to try to help with timing. Um, these models are obviously not orthogonal to each other, but of course the one month model will have more uh, information from the options market to help us forecast equity returns or, or technicals. Uh, or, or other things that, that, while effective, have a shorter duration to their efficacy. And so I think you can work on, 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 on thinking about different horizons, uh, which was a point that was made earlier by one of the panel members, as, as a way to try to think about uh, uh, differentiating yourself and getting new information. But in the end, um, you know, I think the, the biggest weakness with the models, of course, is just that they assume that history will be exactly the same as the future. And I think... Um, what, what, what Ken said is something that I, I think about a lot, which is investors, you know, you, you used the Black Scholes example in 73 and how it sort of ended a few years later. <laughs> investors become increasingly anticipatory. Um, and so uh, I think that's the, the ultimate, uh, ultimate challenge. So anyway, uh, that, that's all I had. Thanks. As this is a conference on sociology and finance at Columbia University, I think we can't let pass without mention the, the phrase self-fulfilling prophecy, which two of the speakers used, I believe is, was coined by the Columbia sociologist Robert Merton, who of course is also the father of Robert Merton, who is shared the Nobel Prize for work on, on option pricing theory. Uh, so with that historical note, uh, why don't we open it up for, uh, for questions from the audience. <laughs> and you please use the microphone. Uh, question, to what extent, it's really two related questions, to what extent the widespread prevalence of Nobel Prize endorsed models uh, created a moral hazard for financial institutions. So therefore we got the imprimatur of Nobel Prize, therefore it's safe, and therefore we could take more risk. And related to that is to what extent does top management of major financial institutions, not the risk officers, but the top management, understand the health warnings associated with the models? I'll take a shot at the second one, which is I think that at some firms, probably top management, do understand um, the models, and at a lot of firms, um, they don't. But I think what's interesting for me, just sociologically, is that if you look at the people who got hurt most by the, by the financial crisis, um, Merrill, uh, Liebman, um, Bear Stearns, the people at the top don't seem to blame the modelers. 
you don't see the head of the head of Merrill Lynch saying, "Oh, our risk models are wrong." I think people understood they were taking vast amounts of risk. And I don't think the Icelandic banks went bankrupt because they were using black shoals. I think it's a more a question of incentives. Okay. Um, as one of the speakers uh, noted, um, everyone who makes a decision is, in effect, they're using a model whether they're aware of it or not. Um, and it seems like a theme of this discussion is that the reason why using precise mathematical models can be more dangerous is that it, it leads to coordination um, across uh, dispersed um, actors. Um, my, one of the things that I didn't notice was, was addressed um, is that, or, well, the question is how realistic is it for individuals to, to opt out of using a model once it becomes standard? Um, and, and what do we do if we know that a market has become infected, in a sense, by uh, the use of a, a, of a single standard model. So um, that's an interesting question. Um, what I found in my own uh, research is that um, the dysfunctions created by uh, the use of the implied probability, which led to arbitrage disasters, uh, is something that is not just it's not just me and my co-author who, who understood this mechanism was at play. Uh, so there was a hedge fund, specifically uh, Atticus, who also understood that this was going on. And they actually developed a strategy to, uh, to make money of situations where uh, everybody was too persuaded uh, that, a, that an arbitrage, that a merger was going to, uh, to happen uh, because the spreads were low. So um, I think that, that uh, an interesting way to think about the uh, dysfunctions created by models is that they can open up uh, room for opportunities. I'm not sure I'm going to answer your question, but what you made me think of was um, something very sim much much more simple, <laughs> uh, uh, which is price momentum as a, a factor for predicting subsequent stock performance and um, and the persistency with which since around 1920. Um, with two or three huge failure periods, including one of the more substantial ones being in 2009. But just that, that people um, know that price momentum is, is out there and everyone looks at it and uses it, um, but not very many, many people try to think about what causes, uh, causes it. <laughs> um, they just sort of simply acknowledge that you're battling, running uphill into the wind not to look at it. I'm not sure that had anything to do with your question, but for some reason that's what it made me think of. It's, it's the most well-known studied concept, yet it's still prevalently used. So I, I don't, I guess, automatically assume that just because everyone knows about something, it can no longer ever be effective again, albeit it's tough to say that in a year where its price momentum's been the worst it's been since 1933. But <laughs> I think it will work again. Um, let me, I, I think this is kind of what you're asking. Um, I mean, I think one of the things the recent financial crisis has taught, certainly a number of financial firms, is that they need to really pay attention to their risk officers. And by the way, this is, I should mention, you know, I'm not involved in certainly the firm-wide risk management at Goldman. And what I'm saying about other firms is just based on what I've gleaned from the newspapers. But it certainly sounds like there were a lot of situations where uh, the, the people in charge of risk management within the firms didn't have as much power as maybe they should have because there were groups within the firms that had made a lot of money over a very short time. And, um, and you know, if you've made a lot of money for five years, you, uh, you, uh, you get a lot of power within an organization. And I th certainly think people are much more aware of now of this now than they were a few years ago that, you know, it, it could be just because somebody's made money for five years doesn't mean they're going to make money going forward. And you really need to dig in and understand why they made money. You know, were they using a, a model which does have some flaws built into it? And I think, you know, that's what good risk, risk officers have tried to do for a long time. And I think, you know, those people going forward are probably going to have a lot more power within these organizations, which I view as a very good thing.
Just one last thought. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, dissonance, dissonance between fundamental stock pickers and quant stock pickers, and the quants get blamed when the, 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 this last cycle's happened. But not, not that you'd want to necessarily mention this, uh, but I think it takes about 70 years to figure out whether you're a good stock picker or not, and about 200 to figure out whether you're a good asset allocator. So, um, you know, blaming uh, quants for performance in a three, six, or nine month time horizon seems silly. I just want to amplify on something that Kent said earlier, which is that I don't think people are as stupid about models as, I don't think traders are as stupid as people think about using wrong models. The example that um, Professor McKenzie said about, um, um, about the volatility skew, after 87, people saw that the market crashed and the immediately models started to deviate from black shoals. And although people still use black shoals to price things, the prices that went into there weren't consistent with Black Scholes and forced it to adjust. And in late 1999, the central banks did something about gold. I think they suddenly started to, I don't remember, either buy or sell gold. And there had been no volatility skew in, in gold options. And ever since then, there's been an upward skew in gold because people know gold tends to jump up rather than jump down. So it's inconsistent with the model, but people don't, people fudge the model to, uh, to accommodate reality. Okay, I'm Guru Huberman, I teach here at Columbia. So the financial crisis presented lots of companies that failed for different reasons. And what is triggering my question is Emmanuel's statement about incentives. And I want to go back 11 years to the failure of LTCM. Now, Wall Street never assembled a more experienced, brighter team that understood Black Shoals. And they were very well incentivized in the sense that we know after the failure, some of them had more than 100% of the net worth tied up in the management company. So it would be interesting to know what you think caused the failure of LTCM. If you understand that, we may make a step forward in understanding failures. I only have conventional answers to that, which is that they took so many positions in illiquid securities, so leveraged, that, when the, that after the Russian default crisis, uh, Everybody, there was a flight to quality and everything that was illiquid. And a lot of trades are based on buying illiquid things and hoping that in the long run you'll get buying them cheaply and getting your value back. Everything, um, everything illiquid became, just like happened in the last years, everything illiquid became uh, forbidden, sort of. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. They were, I knew some of those people and they were the smartest people, both from a theoretical and a pragmatic point of view. So what are you going to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I think a lot of it, too, and again, this is just based on, you know, reading various books, talking to various people involved, but it certainly sounds like they, uh, they went into a lot of positions which looked like a good value and may very well have been good value in the long term. A lot of other people piled into the same positions, and then when they were hit with a shock, they were forced to sell, this pushed prices down. Other people bailed out of the positions, this pushed prices down. They were highly levered. And um, you know, once, once they were underwater, even though the prices were maybe even better. And in fact, by the way, I, my understanding is that the, the various banks, et cetera, that took over those positions actually did pretty well on them. You know, certainly LTCM didn't benefit from that. I'd like to jump in, follow up on uh, something that Kent just alluded to, the, this notion of many people moving into uh, the, the same trade. Uh, when we talk about the role of quantitative finance in the financial crisis, uh, we're mainly, I think, implicitly thinking about things like the Gaussian copula, uh, derivatives, and the credit crisis. But uh, back in August of 2007, what's now been kind of overshadowed by everything that's happened subsequently, we had a kind of mini quant crisis uh, within the, the the hedge fund world, uh, and I think the the sort of con conventional understanding of what's hap what happened there. Uh, in retrospect, was a result of many different uh, hedge funds moving into the same kinds of strategy and then all trying to uh, unwind su simultaneously. Uh, any, anybody on the panel want to comment on the role of uh, quantitative finance and models within that, uh, that, that crisis that uh, preceded the current crisis? I'm happy to. Please. Um, so yeah, so in August of, in fact, in the first week of August 2007, between the 3rd and the 10th, what you saw was some really uh, very dramatic volatility. Um, 
related to you know exactly the sorts of factors that w that were discussed earlier regarding you know valuation, momentum, other standard factors, and these were things that had proven very very successful for a long time. Uh, had uh, certainly the you know models that had been developed on the basis of these I would say anomalies in financial markets were very very successful for a long time, and what happened was a lot of people started managing money using techniques like this, and. Um, what happened was, you know, you may remember that, what, in like, uh, I think late 2006 was really when subprime mortgage started having its problems. It started to spill into kind of more general corporate credit, uh, you know, commercial backed mortgage securities uh, um, uh, in about March. And then in July, there was uh, credit took a really big pounding. There was an announcement uh, by a German bank, IKB, that they were defaulting as a result of uh, a lot of having a lot of subprime mortgages on their balance sheet, and credit spreads spiked up quite a bit. And there was a little bit of a rush for liquidity. Uh, what we saw in the beginning of 07, then starting on about August 3rd, was that uh, a lot of these quant positions started losing money in a really big way in the equity markets. Um, and this goes to both you know, value strategies, momentum strategies, so stocks that would have typically been uh, labeled by standard quantitative techniques as cheap got a lot cheaper, and those that were expensive got a lot more expensive. So interestingly, market volatility, credit volatility, everything else during that week was very, very low. But what we saw was that uh, these, these various quantitative positions took a real pounding. And I think uh, you know, our best explanation for what happened at this point was that um, it was, uh, it was uh, kind of a spiral, that there were a number of multi-strategy funds that uh, probably had some losses in the credit space, and they needed to raise capital very quickly. And a good place, they thought, to raise capital was by selling equities, because they were relatively liquid. So they started selling this depressed prices, which kind of caused a rush for the exit. So, you know, in terms of what were the lessons that, um, that certainly we took from that, well, it was that, you know, you really do need to pay a lot of attention to crowding. And this gets back to the question that uh, you raised earlier about, you know, how much attention should you pay to your models and how much should you revise your models? Well, you should, you know, really pay attention to empirically what you see. And I th the thing we, we learned from that is that you have to pay a lot of attention to the amount of crowding in these positions. Just two, two other things. You know, one is that uh, while there was two days in particular where there was dramatic underperformance in, in August of 07, there was a day or two later where uh, half of that underperformance was, was achieved back positively. M many people that I talk to just don't have that dynamic or flexible of a, of a framework such that they can take their structure where they rank stocks and use it to, to buy them quantitatively and alter it in a day or two or three. It may take them, in many cases, a month. So um, I think a lot of it was shorter term money, uh, not uh, you know, uh, folks with 100% annual turnover or, or, or less. You go. Okay. Um, so um, on, on that issue as well, uh, the quant mini crisis, I think that the question is also related to the previous one about um, the uh, role of uh, noble prices uh, and, and modeling. <laughs> um, and I think, I mean, I agree with, um, uh, Ken's point about the crowding, but I think that this is one instance where it pays off to take a sociological understanding of the decisions to adopt models on the part of the hedge funds and the uh, prop trading desks at the investment banks. And so, uh, obviously, uh, there's a lot of analysis that goes into the decision to use a model or not, but sometimes uh, in the explanation that has to go to the superior or the superior of the superior, um, things get simplified and, and the fact that uh, there's a Nobel Prize um, uh, brand behind a certain formula helps uh, one get sort of like the go ahead to adopt a model. So in the case of uh, long-term capital, going back to Gore's question, um, Donald has actually developed um, a theory of um, what is it that was problematic there. And uh, what he coins the notion of the super portfolio is that at some point, the trades being done uh, at LTCM became consensus trades, became trades that were legitimate, that people deemed to be safe and sound. And so at some, it got to the point where um, there were too many people having the same position as long-term capital. So when an unforeseen contingency came up, uh, 
then there were some dynamics uh, there that were not sort of like originally uh, envisioned. Uh, as for the uh, 2008 uh, mini, mini crisis, uh, uh, the analysis by Andy Law, which I think is also what informs uh, Seven, that's right. Which is what informs uh, Ken's uh, point of the role of uh, the multi-strategy funds, such as the one that I studied um, uh, years before. Um, the role there is, again, uh, the role of the social networks uh, and the communication that takes place among uh, the different funds that leads to imitation. So I think that these two instances are great examples of how it pays off to uh, have a sociological understanding of imitation and legitimacy in addition to how is it that the models work quantitatively. I, I just wanted to say something off this topic, but on the other topic, and that people are lumping together, I think, the copula model and the Black-Scholes model in some way that I don't really, I don't really agree with. And I think once in, the Black-Scholes model is a structural model, and it makes a lot of assumptions but explicit assumptions about how underlies evolve with geometric Brownian motion and then says, if you accept all of that, you can replicate an option and have a recipe for creating it, as Donald said earlier. Um, and um, its assumptions are perfectly clear, and it's a structural model. The Gaussian copula model is not a hedging model. It doesn't tell you how to hedge. It doesn't have dynamics. It's an econometric model. And I think the comparison between the two, people like to compare implied volatility or realized volatility to realized default correlation, but you can observe realized volatility every day. You can't observe realized correlation. There isn't such a good market in implied correlation. There's a good market in implied volatility, and um, you can't hedge. So I think, I think there's a glib analogy, but I don't think it's a, it's a, it's a deep analogy. I prefer structural models. Just a, pra a practical thing that was after long-term capital, but um, you know, there are a lot of uh, people who forecast equity returns who actually use information such as institutional ownership or changes in institutional ownership, and, and they actually try to quantify that, that that crowding, I guess. They're, they're saying, well, if I know uh, these guys are good managers, I'm going to try to do what they just did as, as fast as possible. And there was periods of time where, uh, where, where that strategy actually did generate subsequent strong uh, stock performance. So um, I, I know some people use in their equity alpha models uh, changes in level of institutional ownership as, as positive signals for subsequent stock performance. So it's actually a quantified crowding, almost. Just on a sociology note, uh, how, how much of this uh, may have been caused by people who got 800 in math and 200 in context and just are obsessed with trying to figure out stuff that in the end maybe we can't figure out and we're just going to repeat this? I mean, we are going to repeat it. There's no question about that. But I mean, just because what strikes me about what's happened is much of it, what was actually going on on the ground, I mean, not up here, but was preposterous. If you look, if you look at real estate and some, you know, some other related, I mean, and, and it really wasn't captured, despite all these explanations. I mean, maybe it's just the, the nature of the beast, what you people are like. <laughs> I, I, can, I, can, I can maybe address part of that. Um, so one of the things that the manager of the trading room that I did my ethnography on said to me is, um, I can find you lots of people in this trading room that would be miserable at a cocktail party, meaning that uh, uh, the, um, there's a certain uh, profile of, um, uh, I guess, um, highly articulate uh, mathematical quantitative intelligence uh, that might not take in the, the context into account. But what's interesting is that at the level of that uh, prop trading, uh, trading room, uh, the manager himself had developed a recipe to address that, and the recipe was uh, knowledge management. It was uh, to put into place managerial uh, procedures to force people to talk to each other and to promote uh, a culture of cohesiveness and trust, such that uh, even those who are not naturally inclined to uh, talk to others and, and, and take context into account uh, would end up doing so. And, and that was one of the ways in which he thought that the, um, that the bank had, a, had, a, had an edge in a way to attain alpha. I, I think it's, I mean, maybe when people build models, they often have to prove that they worked historically before they can implement them. And so many of the things that may seem on the ground obvious, like uh, uh, credit spreads are 
are moving are, are, are moving dramatically down since March, and so there's going to be something different about momentum or earnings revisions or something that's in your model. You know, maybe that isn't in your model because it, you know CDS is a perfect example. You you could say that I learned you know, two years ago that uh, high CDS equals bad subsequent stock performance because I saw Lehman or Bear, but then you, you don't have that in your equity model, alpha model that forecasts. So it's something might be obvious on the ground, but it may not have enough history and data that you can back test it, prove it work, and stick it in your model, and therefore it's, it's going to be missed for a while. I mean, I, I, yeah. I like your question very much, because I think what it implies is, you know, that there are some people who are very, very good at solving math equations, but who are not very good about really thinking through carefully whether their model represents reality or not. And certainly, you know, I just heard a snicker because I think we all know that this is true. That there are a lot of people out there like that. And I think if you want to have a successful quant model, again, you know, the important thing is you've got to subject this model to every piece of scrutiny you have. You've got to ask, you know, why does it work? What makes it tick? Can we throw data at it and does it hold up? When does it work? When doesn't it work? And if you don't have an organization that promotes that kind of scrutiny of your models, then, you know, you're going to, it's going to be a failure. You really need to have, be constantly thinking, does this make any sense or not? Okay, well, I think that's all the time we have for the, uh, the panel. We have a coffee break now, but let's thank our speakers for their uh, comments. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed the comments. Thanks.